y'all doing? Good, 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 yeah. good, good. Pack Palooza, nominal, phenomenal. I love it. I love it. Pack Palooza was fun. Good, good, good. All right. Well, I have to be the bearer of bad news. You know, uh, obviously, you just finished up your lecture exercise, so hopefully, you know, you did knock that out. Um, it will just because I got some emails. I apologize for it to be for it being at eleven forty-five. I forgot to change that part of it. Um, it's always going to be at class time. So just if that happens, shoot me a message. I immediately will fix it. However, with that out of the way, uh -huh, let me boom. You already have your first problem set is released. You do not have access to it yet. You will get access to it after class. I don't need you just downloading and trying to work on it during class because some of y'all are very vocal uh, when you code, I've noticed in the past. So I'm going to wait until after class for you to play around with it. However, uh, I've been talking about it. I spent all of last week talking about it as well. So essentially, you are going to be designing and controlling an artificial rational agent. You're going to be, look at that. Excuse you. You're going to be the little green dot. That's it. Your entire job is, hey, here's my environment. It's a you know, two-dimensional grid-based world. Brown equals dirty. Gray equals clean. Clean the floor. So some swiping, of, uh, you know, some sweeping of the floor. Uh, the big things here, uh, one, I got a full-on uh, video walking through the entire uh, code base because as you will see, as you kind of mess around with it, it's a lot, you know, here's, you're downloading, this is, this is it, right? This is, it's a lot of different files, it's a lot of different connections. Maybe you want to understand what I did, right? You know, it, it's a big project uh, that has a GUI attached to it, right? You know, maybe you want to uh, actually kind of see what was going on with all of this stu stuff. I have very extensive documentation there as well to help explain it. Uh, so that's what that walkthrough does. Uh, if you don't have Eclipse for whatever reason, there's your guide. Um, I can update that to 21. Uh, I just kind of noticed as I'm walking through it. I got it at 17 because that's what we were using at the time. I see that we're doing 21. At this point, like nothing in the code should like break if you're, if you're on 17 or if you're on 21. If it does, let me know. Um, but it should be fine either way. Uh, if you don't know how to bring a zip file into Eclipse, there's the guide there as well, some other stuff. But at the end of the day, you care about what you need to do once you've got it set up. You only will be submitting one file. You're not submitting a .zip. You're not submitting any kind of GitHub link. I want a .java file, specifically... Inside of there, inside of the project, there is one file in particular that you will be submitting. In this case, it is known as robot. It changes a little bit from project to project, but at the end of the day, it is an agent. I've got it hooked up so you know it, it does the very bare minimum of, hey, I know what the environment looks like. That's about it. Uh, or at least I have a connection to what the environment is. Your job is to modify get action. You see, inside of my code, inside of uh, the entire test base, if I were to go and just jump to when, uh, let's see, environment, let me go to there, right there, right? Inside of environment, again, this is already built for you, it's already given for you, you might, might notice, hey, there's a nice little for loop, you know, just in case there's multiple robots. Uh, but action, action equals robot get action, that is, me. I'm, that, that is how I evaluate your entire robot situation is, hey, give me an action. That's it. Uh, so in that case, you know, I've given you a breakdown of some of the different techniques that you can do. Again, there's comments to try and help explain it along the way as well. Um, you know, again, you have a, uh, a get neighbor tiles, and this is your way of being able to say, hey, who are my neighbors, right? Again, if you're thinking about this from a two-dimensional plane, right, especially in a larger space, here's you. Whoa. 
wouldn't it be great to know my neighbors, right? So that's exactly what you can do. You can see, you know, uh, get my neighboring tiles so you can see who's above you, below you, left and right of you. You can also see yourself. Uh, this is just me doing some print statements so you can see. Uh, I will go ahead and throw out that comment. Be mindful of that. You remember 216, right? You do remember 216? You remember something called a null pointer exception? Yeah, yeah. Guess what? You know, if this is literally the top of the map, then when you try and get your above neighbor, it's going to be null, right? It, it, that's how I'm saying it. It's just, you know, you're out of bounds, null. Uh, so be mindful of that because I've seen some of your logic in the past where you, you kind of forget about that. So just be mindful of it. Um, and then, yeah, that's it. That's all I've given you. So how do I evaluate you? So there is uh, a test. Well, before I get to evaluating, um, there are two versions of the simulation. So there is something called run simulation, which is just, uh, you know, it runs the simulation, not, not too fancy. The one that uh, typically students kind of like to work off of because it helps me debug your stuff, it helps you debug your stuff, is the visualize simulation.java file. The entire idea here is I've got a nice little file where you can visualize your maps or you can change the configuration. So arbitrarily, I'm going to switch that. So if I wanted to see, hey, I implemented, what am I doing here? I'm just moving to the right. Cool. Visualize simulation. Run as, run. Yep. Look at it go. Right? And you can see there's some nice little, hey, just kind of case in points, there's that null pointer exception I was talking about. Right? Uh, but you can see, hey, you can try these out. You can see each one of the different ones um, as you're kind of working through. Notice, right, this one's going to be much more difficult because walls are just everywhere. That's a wall. Since I, okay, we're good with, that's a wall. Yeah, that, that is a wall. The agent is still saying, go right, right? Remember, that's all the logic my thing is saying. Hey, move to the right, move to the right, move to the The environment's not going to let you, right? You're just hitting the wall the entire time. Um, if, for whatever reason, that map is, or that configuration is a little too uh, big for you uh, because you're on a laptop, there is a config small. You can see all of them down here as well. Uh, so run that. There's a tiny version of it so you can see the same thing, but works for your uh, screen. You're more than capable or more than willing, you know, you're more than allowed to mess around with these configurations. As you can see, they're not uh, elaborately uh, difficult. They're just a variable with an equal sign. I have code and explanations on how that gets loaded in there if you'd like. So if you want to slow down, How many milliseconds? So 10,000 milliseconds. Much slower. Uh, oh, hold on. Uh, I got to do... There. Now it's much slower. 10,000 milliseconds is 10 seconds. Look at it. Right. No, so, I mean, again, this is, you can mess around with it, you can play around with it. The big thing is, obviously, um, the only thing I'm going to care about from a grading perspective is robot.java. So don't mess around with environment, don't mess around with, up, you know, visualize simulation, don't mess around with anything else from the, like, here side of things, uh, unless you want to, like, fiddle, because I've seen some students fiddle and make, you know, silly games with the environment, but that's... You know, don't do that on problems that you're, you're, you know, the one that you're doing for your homework. That's that's the important part. Question? Yeah. Should we always assume that all the tiles will start dirty, or is it possible that sometimes there might be like some? So the the question is on specifically uh, to assume whether or not they're dirty or clean. Uh, so again, you're given access to the first five of the maps. Ten of them are hidden away from you. You will never see them until, you know, uh, the 12th. Uh, but how do you tackle situations where there are clean tiles? 
This is meant to be, yes, this is meant to make your brain stretch. So yes, you know, you're going to clean all of this, but what do you do here? Right. Uh, that yes, open question. Uh, that one's a nice little fun one, uh, and then that one's just hurting your brain some more. Um, things that I can recommend, uh, just to go through it before I, I move ahead. As you walk through something, let me. As you sort of, let me pick a. a as you kind of make your decisions, right? Think about what's going on in this tiny, you know, two by two area right here. Well, you made a decision. You, royal you, make a decision to go to B1. Well, what should you do about A2? Should you just forget it ever existed? Or, like I said last week, something about your precept history, remembering what you've seen before. Maybe a stack would be beneficial, right? Go back to your 316 lamb when you learned about what a stack can do. It's an undo function. What if I hit a dead end? We'll talk about dead ends today. Wouldn't it be nice to backtrack? Mm. Uh, but just to keep on going, just because of, I want to move on to the sake of time, when it comes to grading, uh, so I've already said you've got five of them. We're working off of uh, this test uh, file. There's a, a private version that you don't get, the TAs get. Uh, you get 100 trials. What this means is every map, you are going to run that map 100 times, Okay. So five maps, each one run 500 times. They're going to be run for 200 steps. So you get to do 200 actions uh, for that. And that changes every once in a while. Uh, there is a duration just to make sure you're not, you know, you, your, your robot hasn't blown up. Uh, but the big thing here is how do you determine if you had a successful trial? So I'm going to run, again, the trial every map. 100 times. You need to pass or be successful 70% of the time. So what does it mean to be successful? Performance map, performance map. There's your math. That is the math of determining just how your performance measure for your agent. What I'm saying when it comes to testing is if that performance measure is greater than 70%. So if you clean 70% of the floor, we're going to do it again. And you got to do it again. And you got to do it 70 times total. Does that make sense? That one always seems to like confuse people. It's known as the Monte Carlo simulation. We'll get into it a little bit more later in the semester. But essentially, this is my way of you are going to use random at some point in this class. In fact, you are going to be encouraged to use random in some parts of this class. What's wrong with random? Is what? Not really random. Not really random. You can't really trust it. You know, what if it just keeps on telling you to move up the entire time? Yeah. So this is my way of saying, all right, well, since I can't 100% trust random all the time, rather than just doing a seed or something like that, Shotgun effect. I'm going to run ran, I'm going to let you run random 70% of the, or, you know, 100 times. Just needs to be successful 70% of the time. Okay, good luck. Uh, the last little bit for this is that it's due in one week. Um, specifically, this first problem set is a little bit of getting your, again, getting you familiar with uh, the code base that I'm working with. You're going to be seeing this throughout the semester, so it's not meant to be this crazy difficult, but also at the same point, right, you know, hey, move up, move down, move left, right. Program a robot to do that, right? That's a little difficult, so that's my way of giving you a chance to kind of work off of it, so please have fun with that one, uh, you know. Yes? So the, primarily, this class will be in Java. Um, you can, we will have something in Prologue uh, towards our logic section. Um, the way I'd look at it is if you're looking for, like, I want to learn Python with programming, take everything that, where are you? Come on. Rebuild this in Python. Yeah. Yep. Some 
So with this question is specifically what should they uh, be uh, aware of? Where's the thingy? Where, there it is. That's the, that's, so if we're looking at environment, environment has these methods attached to it. They're, some of them are public, some of them are protected, uh, but you might notice uh, specifically, where are you? Um, mm -hmm. You have access to get neighboring tile. Um, there might be some other ones that you, oh yeah, you can technically also do get tiles. I did make that one public, so you can either have it be very closed-minded or big open. That's much more, again, problem set one is very much very forgiving, get you familiar with the code base rather than like, aha, which one? As we get into the other ones, it'll be much more concrete. So like um, problem set two, for example, having access to everything, you will, but the problem is it's not going to be beneficial to you. Do not. Do not. Okay. You are not uploading environment. This is what I am grading off of. Yes. Correct. Yes. Uh, no, all the maps are not the same size. Um, are they? This, uh, that, we'll get to that. Uh, so if we're there. Uh, yeah, so not all the maps are the same size. Don't, you know, yes, I based it kind of on that, but there's your example of no, they are not. Uh, you will be starting in the same spot, though. So you can go ahead and go ahead and be like, oh, I'm starting at the top left. Okay, well, I've spent an hour. I need to go ahead and start lecturing. So before we kind of jump into, uh, you know, really digging into our, our pathfinding algorithms and things like that, we do need to kind of look at the idea of search, right? When we think about sort of where we're where we sit this class at NC State, you know, you've just finished 316. You've just finished the idea of what is uh, a a graph and a graph like structure. And you know, Dr. King or whoever whoever you took showed you sort of this concept of traversing through these graphs. Well, they were just kind of showing it as a you know, I want to walk through a graph. We want to do it from a problem solving perspective. Because if we're thinking about problem solving, again, this is, uh, some of these slides are almost very similar to what I show in 116, right? There are things when we think about search that are, or when we think about problem solving, that are instantaneous, right? Big O of one, right? You can look at that formula and implement it no problem. But the problem is, right, not every problem has a quick, easy mathematical solution that someone figured out already for us, right? That's, we wish they had, but that's not the case. A lot of what we're dealing with, when we're especially when we're trying to problem solve or find solutions to situations, is requiring that searching aspect. Again, this is what looking at a linear data structure was, right? The list, search the list. Okay, well, that's easy. What about when we start to get into much more complicated, you know, connections? Literally, if you think about that, right, and you'll see this later, that's technically a grid, right? That's technically a graph with relations of there's a connection between A1 and B1, right? And there's technically another connection. There's another edge on A1 to A2, maybe A1 to B2, depending on how you implement uh, traversal. So when we're starting to kind of work off of this kind of searching approach, we've got two different terminologies that we want to work off of. The search space and then the goal condition. The search space is essentially, hey, you know, given this is what I can see, right, what actions could I possibly take? So in this case, what actions could I possibly take? Uh, move to the left, move down, move to the right. And let's arbitrarily say, here's my goal condition, right? Okay, well, I can only take, in this case, one of three actions. 
So let's arbitrarily say I move to the left, right? That little space there, what's going to be the new thing? I'm going to be right here. That's where we get into the secondary question. Am I at or do I satisfy my goal condition? If I look, so again, specifically, this is my goal. If I look at here. I, I made a traversal, right? You can see this is very clearly a tree structure that is formed, and I'm saying, hey, am I at my goal? No. Okay, well, that just means keep on moving. What are my options? Could I move to the right, to the move to the left, move down? I can continue to do this. Another way, let's arbitrarily assume, for the sake of argument, that America is the only country in the world. Thank you. The Americans in here understand. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, so here's, again, it's also because I had to make all this. Uh, so my point being is, all right, we've got tons of airports going on here. We are in Raleigh. We're on the East Coast. But some of you are looking for jobs. Maybe you're looking on for jobs on the West Coast. Maybe you want to work for Amazon or something like that. So if we're looking at that, you know, all right, who here's taking an airport? An air, who here's been to the airport and taken a plane? Yeah, a lot of you. If you haven't, oh, live, live. My point being is, okay, well, I want to get to Seattle from RDU. How do I just, without thinking price and all that stuff, give me a path uh, from RDU to Seattle. I could go to Charlotte, into Chicago, into Seattle. Yeah, makes perfect sense. Right? So much sense, <laughs> I made it into a slide. We can also, but here's why I kind of present that. That is a solution, right? That is a good solution. Is it the only solution? No. Technically speaking, I have an alternative solution. I could take RDU down to Charleston, hit Jacksonville, do some weird stuff in Panama City, Pensacola, then go back to Atlanta and then to Lipo. Uh, I want to go and try some of the, you know, the Nashville hot stuff in Memphis, not Nashville. But then I got to go to Dallas, into Denver, to Salt Lake, into Seattle. All I'm going to present to you is, am I at my goal? Then it's perfectly fine. This is a, this is a valid path. This is a sufficient solution to this path. Because I didn't ask about performance measures. I didn't say I wanted the cheapest or the most minimal hops. You, you took that and you made your brain think those things because I contextualized it to airports and you want to minimize how much flight time you're going on. But what if, for arbitrary reason, my, my uh, performance measure was spend the most money possible uh, to get to Seattle? Right? Mr. Beast, I know he's canceled or not canceled. I don't know. Mr. Beast is probably one of those you know, people who'd be like, ah, you got to spend the most money you can to get to Seattle and you win a Tesla or something. Right? How are you going to spend the most money to get there? But that's where we start to kind of look at the differences in search. Right? We're trying to be these most efficient places. And that's exactly what you learned when you learned about the linear versus the binary search. Right? Big O of N versus log in came into play as we started to kind of look at these things. So when we're starting to explore that search, yes, I was doing it here uh, with a 2D world. But again, if you kind of notice when I was showing the airports, I can still map that same structure using sort of just a simple graph or tree traversal. I have my current location. right? I have my location at RDU. Where are all the possible pathways I can go from RDU? Oh, well, I've got Charlotte and Atlanta. I think I tried to do it. That's supposed to be Atlanta. Charleston, Pensacola, Washington Dulles. Uh, I didn't put them all in there for the sake of, I didn't realize it. Uh, but my entire point, right, you can see there's Charlotte, there's, I think that's Memphis, uh, Dallas, and Atlanta. And I can continue explain, uh, exploring out there. What's one thing that you might notice eerily about, say, my, my pathway from RDU into Memphis? Or I think that's Memphis. Or Charleston. That's definitely Charleston. 
Where can I go from Charleston? I can go back to RDU, right? Is anything stopping me from moving to the right? I can, right? It depends on what the problem is, what your constraints allow you to do. Am I not allowed to touch the same tiles or the same classes? Or can I go back and forth? Both of them technically work. Um, what I will say for our sake, you know, when it comes to what I'm going to show you for this class, we're going to act like I don't go back. All right? I cannot go back to a path. Why? It makes our lives easier uh, on that sake because the second you start allowing cyclical you know, pathways, right, everything just gets ugly because that might be your cheapest route for the longest time until something else comes. You'll see it later on. Um, so in our, at least our case, you know, again, if I'm at RDU, I go to Charleston, I cannot go back to RDU, right? Got to go somewhere else first unless I hit dead ends. Um, questions before we start talking about chess? Okay, so... Kind of why I present that is, okay, I've shown you now sort of this, this agent that can walk on a 2D plan, you know, left, right, up, down. But then I also showed you sort of airport traversal. Well, those are not just the only possible ways of doing a search. And this is where some of the things I like to do is I also like to give you some of our traditional AI problems or optimization style problems because a lot of what we're talking about in sort of this first section is mostly about optimization, right? It's not just find the best path or get to the location. Sometimes it's give me a proper configuration, give me a better configuration. And so that's where we introduce something known as the in queen problem. Essentially, all right, I have an in by in board. In this case, I've got a four by four board. All right. Since I have a four by four board, that means I have four queens. Place each queen on my board such that they cannot attack each other. Oh, okay, all right. It's actually a very complicated thing. I know I'm giving you a four by four because it looks pretty on the slides, but what happens if I turned it into a 10 by 10 problem? Could you solve that? Yeah, you could probably solve it, but it'd take you some time and a little, you know, it's not as quick and easy as you would think. Uh, as you can see, you know, I've got one version that is good. I got one version is bad. But how would I design out a system that could make this configuration, right? Again, it's sort of just a, a toy example, uh, but we'll see as we move throughout the course how these toy examples turn into real-world uh, applications. And so in this situation... Maybe, right, you could design out your search algorithm so that, hey, I'm just going to start with focusing on uh, just one corner first or specifically just one, what am I doing here? Yeah, just this first column first, right? Okay, well, where are my possible situations? Where are the possible places that I can place it? I'm starting here just for the sake of, you know, not putting it there. All right, well... If that column has already been used and you're using sort of your, 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 your big people brains to go, oh, well, queen, no other queens can go on that column, right? Maybe my next search is like, well, what are the other possible columns? And I can look because, again, I'm only placing one queen at a time to ensure that I don't break my rules. Does this one work? No. Two queens are right now. Does this one work? Yeah. Does this one work? Yeah. So I've got two possible actions or options. I just sort of picked one to expand upon. So if I went with this first version, then what are my other options? And each one of these, I think, no, that one doesn't work. That one does work. That one does work. Uh, either way, you can see as we keep on uh, stepping through, we would eventually get to our, excuse me, target in which all of my goal conditions are met. Every one of my queens cannot attack another queen, right? So this is, again, what I was trying to get at earlier is this idea that sometimes, right, 
we present things in this graph-like structure. But then sometimes you start to see them in non-graph-like worlds, like a tile-based two-dimensional you know, uh, grid structure. And what I kind of present is like, okay, if this is what your problem set one is, or this is what you know, your game is, or whatever your space is, uh, hey, that's technically just a, a, a graph, right? I took the exact same structure. I have a starting point. I have a goal point. I have walls. Well, walls are just no connection between two nodes, right? Suddenly, oh, the connections between my two neighbors, my two neighboring tiles of A5 and B6, A5, B6. And I can keep going with the same structure over and over again. As you can see, uh, the big thing I've got going on here is I'm just making the assumption that all of my edges traversing from one tile to the next is a one. Game development students, what could increasing edges to different numbers represent? Like a slope or some sort of like rough terrain? Yeah, so slopes, rough terrain. Maybe you want, you know, in this case, uh, it's not just a two dimensional world. We got to go back all the way to my favorite game growing up, Final Fantasy Tactics, uh, where you had just your level, and then if you wanted to go up a level, all right, well, it was a height. It was another block up. Minecraft is a great other example of this, right? Uh, so, all right, you know, if they're flat, all right, it doesn't cost anything. But if they're two, three, 15, right, you can start to specify the height differences to show that it's much more difficult to traverse these things as necessary. So when we get into all of these, you know, this kind of world, we have a lot of our, our basic traditional uh, search methods. Uninformed is specifically what we're trying to present here where I don't know if I'm doing any better or worse. As I continue to make my search, I'm not doing any other assessment on how well I'm doing, except am I at the goal condition? So almost think of it like an if statement. At every traversal, all I'm asking is, am I at the goal? Okay, well, then you've got the traditional ones, right? You've got your breadth and depth first searches that you learned about in 316 and data structures. Uh, but the entire idea is what we're starting to look at, and this kind of gets into or pulls from what you were learning in your, your 316 land, is that idea of space and time complexity. What are the most optimal approaches for them? Again, just like you learned in 316, just like you'll hear from me way too much uh, in this class. What do you think the two words are? It. Works. No. Starts with a D. It depends. It depends, right? It'll depend on what your problem is because, you know, different solutions will work better for different uh, problems. So as we're kind of starting to get with this, again, what we're, we have to shape our kind of presentation of we want to evaluate these algorithms and we want to evaluate the search. Remember, what we're going to have to do, especially when we're dealing with uh, 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 trying to find goals, is we're going to have to evaluate essentially every node, right? And we'll, we'll sort of get where, how can we fix that later on? But we have to evaluate you know, every node to determine if we can get to a goal condition. So we have a few different variables that float about uh, on us. That first one is B, the branching factor. What we're essentially asking here is, again, all right, from any given state, how many actions can I take? What are the, all the possible actions? Because that's a branch that fractures or, you know, that fragments things out. Depth, again, you know, how deep do I need to go to get an optimal solution? Uh, because, again, certain ones, if I'm going cyclical, can go into infinity. 
if I don't allow for uh, cyclical traversal of airports, right, I would prefer something that is four hops over 20 hops, right? Same kind of thing. Then we've got the maximum depth. That's, again, where we potentially could have infinity or uh, just a fixed, like, I have to exhaust every possible move before I find out if I'm at a goal or not. And we'll see actually some examples of that uh, when we get into adversarial search. Um, so again, with Brett first, this is a little bit of a refresher. I won't spend a lot of time on it, mostly because this is stuff from 316, more of a like wake your brain up, uh, welcome back to school uh, kind of thing. Uh, so again, we, we visit ourselves, and then we start to look at our neighbors. And then, you know, before we do any, you know, deep dive, we evaluate those neighbors of neighbors first. Uh, this is that same pseudocode that you probably saw in 3.16. Uh, it's about the same. You know, what, what does it mean to encounter? Uh, yes. What do you, what would you want encountering to be? Do it. Uh, the way I would say it is that's when you're checking if you're at your goal condition, right? Uh, but the big thing specifically that we kind of look at is notice how we're starting to introduce or we're starting to just be very comfortable using those data structures that you learned in 316 and 216, right? The queue is just something that you have to know now. Do you have to implement the queue for this class? No, right? Dr. King, you know, that's the end of 316. You're allowed to use the Java standard library stuff. Yeah, you can, you can do that from my, I don't, I don't, don't, don't. I've seen what you do when you try and build your own stuff. <laughs> Glad that you laughed. <laughs> no, my point being is, again, as we're starting to look at this, again, as we go through the queue-like structure, right, I like to kind of represent it in this kind of very simple approach. Yes, I'm working off of a tree, but I have a graph a little bit later. The idea is, hey, we've got this queue. I like to kind of represent it as whatever node I'm at with a knot, right, the zero, right? I'm starting here, and that's a very important thing because oftentimes we'll find that I need to go back to my start loca location in order to find my path or find my, my way from the goal to where I'm currently at. So again, as I remove that element from the queue, right? I, I, I'll even, see, I wanna, we'll go purple, right? Okay, so I just visited A, visited, encountered, whatever you wanna start to think about it. And so the idea is, right, what do I do next? I have just visited this possible path, and I'm now trying to assess or this possible configuration, situation, scenario, whatever term you want to work off of. I now need to think, what do I do next, regardless of the, uh, uh, the goal? And so what the breadth first search is saying is, all right, there was an A naught in here. It's gone. Let me assess all of my potential next actions from this current configuration. I use alphabetical order. Uh, that's just my way of keeping my brain on track. Sometimes it doesn't work all the time. Yell at me when that doesn't work because apparently uh, H comes after E, as we all know, right? So again, the same situation's coming into play. I've mapped out all of these. These are all being added into the queue, and we all understand the concept of the queue. First in, first out. So I'm going to remove whatever was that first element that I introduced, and that's what I assess first. Am I at my goal condition? Whatever that goal condition turns out to be, right? In my case, it will be I. Uh, but that's, again, how I walk through these things. Uh, mm -hmm. Boom. I added, well, B has a potential. It has its own child. So F from B is added into the queue. And this entire process continues on. You can already see, uh, or you can click through the slides. Well, just because I introduce that F does not mean I go to it. It's, all right, next thing. 
C from A. Okay, well, did C from A have anything? Yes, it did. It had the G from C. And I'd continue to go through this over and over and over again. So there's where C gets added or removed. That's where D gets removed. E is about to get removed. H is about to get removed. F, G, I. The entire time, every single one of these things that are being removed or turning blue, right, the question I'm asking is, am I at the goal condition? Because again, right, that's what you're trying to do when we think about this from a rational agent's perspective. Given this action, did I succeed? Am I at the goal? Uh, if you don't find a goal, right, if I get to a situation where the, the queue is now officially empty, and goal condition not found, goal condition impossible, or configuration or you know, path, uh, or you know, it's impossible given my current search space. You know, that would be like, uh, here's your agent. Right, and here's the, the goal. Can the agent get to the goal? No, right, there's a giant wall. Okay, that's supposed to be. There's a giant wall uh, blocking it uh, with spikes coming uh, off the top. So if you try and scale the wall, you're gonna get impaled with, no, you can't. Okay, goal's impossible. Goal exists, goal's impossible. Right? Okay, fine. But then we go in, okay, fine, all right. Well, why did I spend so much time drawing a picture of a person and just spending all that time on Brett first search if it's so bad? Well, again, technically, it will succeed, right? Uh, if a goal is possible, it will be the shortest path when you find it. Uh, how long does it take? You know, again, we're looking at the branching factor uh, to however much the optimal depth is plus one. How, do you need to know the, the, that for like a you know, for an exam perspective? No. Uh, but again, it's being familiar with these because a lot of our algorithms are based off of depth or breadth first search. Speaking of depth first, here's depth first. It shifts, it changes things a little bit because, again, the entire idea to the depth first search algorithm was you continue going and you continue down just one rabbit hole forever until you hit the dead end. Then what? I step back. I step back. Let me backtrack until I get back to a situation where I had a choice, right? So I have a choice here with at A, right? I have B, C, D, E, and H. Well, again, this structure changes, right? It's no longer a Q. It's the exact opposite of a Q. It's a stack, first in, last out, right? So yes, A naught, right, is removed, first in, last out. But that's the first thing that's there. B from A was added in. All of them are technically being added in at the same time still. So we see C, uh, D, E, and H once again. However, again, this is a stack structure, right? So it becomes what's the next thing or what's the last thing in the uh, uh, what was the last thing added into the stack? So in this situation, boom, I've added in everything. For my sake, I am working off of just like the first child uh, pairing of these. You could go off of H, but, you know, work with me here. Uh, so again, all right, I go down to B. Get rid of U, so everything kind of mapped out, right? The agent looked at B. All right, well, B sees that I happen to have a new element, right, after I removed B. Again, this is kind of where, you know, from a visualization, a graphic kind of visualization standpoint, I just added it in here. Hey, this is the next thing that you need to 
uh, put in because this was the last thing that got added into this stack-like structure. So F is the next thing that gets traversed. But again, what happens if I'm at a dead end, right? Some of your uh, maps uh, from your homework, right, are going to have dead ends. What do you do? Well, this is where, again, you start to backtrack. I need to go, well, hey, from this spot, where, where did I come from, right? I've, I've visited F. I have assessed F. It is not the goal. But also, F does not have any possible options to move towards. So I backtrack. And again, what does backtracking mean? Uh, you know, this could be something as simple as From a Java perspective, you know, I could just be like, hey, whatever my current is, uh, go back to my, you know, go to my parent now. You're going to need to do much more complicated things than just this, but you understand that at the end of the day, it's just I need to go to where I originally came from, and I have to do it again, right? Again, if we're looking at B, B has no other options. B has no other children that I'd have to be assessing, so I have to continue backtracking up one more time, I have to go from B to A. Oh, then we ask that simple question. Does A have any other options? Yes, it does. They were added technically into the stack or, you know, however you want to kind of present that. And so, oh, C gets added or gets evaluated. And G becomes the next thing that's added to the stack. It's going to be because, again, first in, first out. G gets assessed. I'm at another dead end all over again, right? G has no other options, so I need to make my assessment one more time, backtrack, backtrack again. And then I do it, I didn't, you know, I'm not going to do all of them, but you can see, you know, you just repeat this process over and over again until you, you know, run out of uh, things to traverse. And that's where Dr. King kind of taught you the concept of back edges, forward edges, cross edges, those terrifying terms reminding you. Yeah, yeah. I'm expecting you to just know them. <laughs> right. My point being is, okay, well, what's the proper, you know, what? okay, depth first. What was so good about it? Well, you know, technically, uh, the first solution may not be the, the most sufficient. Uh, because again, I might have infinite loops. I might have, uh, I might find a solution that is not technically the shortest path. It might, you know, look at the maximum, maximum again. If I have to fill up my entire board, I have to do every possible configuration from a mathematical sense, we'll learn that that's not a good option. Okay, so why are we ever searching with depth first search? Well, again, sometimes our, that's what we, it's not that we don't do it, it's that we like both options. We like breadth first search, right? Because it works, but it takes forever because we have to assess everything around us all the time, right? And if you've seen visualizations, sometimes I don't want that. Sometimes I do want, hey, just, just go a little deeper. You know, you're gonna need to you know, go down a, a giant rabbit hole for a little. And that's why I present now your first new introduction uh, pathway or your search, iterative deepening search. Iterative deepening. Essentially what we're going to do is we are going to do breadth first search with depth first search, but we're only going to limit the depth. We're not going to allow it to go down the rabbit hole. It's only allowed to do it once or twice or, you know, eventually get there. Here's a great example. Let's arbitrarily say I'm trying to get to that E node, right? Okay. I see I've got, uh, you know, I'm at A, right? There's my, my, my thing. Notice, though, I have an extra little bit there. I feel like we'll go red. Limit zero. 
the way I want you to think about this term limit, how many steps am I allowed to take in my traversal? So a limit being zero means I am allowed to have zero steps, AKA I start with A. My goal So I ask a very simple question. Am I at my goal condition? Hmm? No, thank you. It sounded like a yep. I wasn't looking at your, your, your lips, and I was like, that's not right. I got to. No, I'm not at my goal condition. OK, so what do I do? I increment limit. Well, hey, you know, I'm not out there. My agent is now allowed to make one step from the starting point. OK, I make one step, B. Am I at the goal condition? No. So I backtrack, because again, depth first, except for depth, you only get to make one depth. Backtrack, hey. Do I have other options? Why, yes, I do. Am I at my goal condition? No. Backtrack. Do I have any other options? You see where this is going, right? No. So what happens? I increment. Limit just went from 1 to two. And guess what? I literally start all over again. I'm allowed to make two steps from A. I'm allowed to do depth first search, two moves. So move one, I get to B. Am I allowed to make another move? Yes. Does B have another move? Yes. Am I at my goal? No, I'm not. So backtrack. I'm now allowed to have one move. Do I have any other moves I can do from B? No, I do not. So I backtrack. And then I do the same thing. OK, well, I can go to C. That's not a C. That's a circle. That's a C. That was one move. Can I make another move? Yes, I can. I can make a move to F. Am I at the goal condition? No, I'm not. OK, well, I backtrack. Does C have any other moves? No. So I backtrack. Does A have any other options? No. So what do I do? Limit becomes 3. We start all over again. And limit becomes three. And you continue through this. And as you can see, that's exactly what I've got going on in the slides here. You would go again until you saw the E. Yes. Say that again. So, test A to B, test A to C, test A B B, test A C F. Um, then next you test D. You know F doesn't have any outgoing edges from it. So D then anything anything new you want to find has to go through D. Oh, okay. Um, so yes, I mean you could play around with that idea of like let me remember what I saw last time. The big thing I will say there is um, during your different searches, you will actually see things slightly differently, um, especially in a graph. I know I'm, I'm cheating and I'm using tree structures, 
Um, but when you get into a graph-like structure, let's say you're not allowed to, uh, you only want to evaluate a, a node once, you know, in that type of situation, right, then I don't, I, I in like limit one, or let me say in limit two, I might see that node from one spot, but then in limit three, it would actually appear from a different spot. So the tree structure is not the same across your limits. So it wouldn't make sense. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because again, like it change, like the the tree structure changes between them. I know mine didn't, but they do. Uh, mm -hmm. That's actually a perfectly good activity for y'all. Uh, let's see. I only got. Uh, I'll give you till. Um, I'll give you till four o three. So I'll give you seven minutes. And we are back, ladies and gentlemen. So I've already got sort of the first, I'm going to go ahead and call them first two of those layer or lim limits already kind of lined up. I'm going to go ahead and give you that same kind of pitch. This will be on your midterm. This will not count on your midterm. I don't care about limit zero. I'm going to ask for like, I think the first three limits of a, a, a graph. Uh, there's, you know, spoiler, right? it's, it'll be on the study guide, but like, I don't care about this one. You give me this one on the midterm, you don't get points on this one, right? Because all you did was show me where you started. Good. So I don't care about that one, no, you know, because again, that's, but as you can see, hey, we expand. And then as we go into level two, the big thing that I'm, I'm kind of trying to stress here is notice how it's not the same as like, what you were seeing in 316, right? 316 had very specific rules to traversal. I'm not going to have those same rules because we're trying to do goal conditions. We're trying, our, our, our purpose for goal, uh, for traversal is different. We're trying to find a goal. So, you know, I took this pathway and I ended up at D. Well, you know, let me look and take a different pathway. I got to the same location, but that's a different, you know, situation, or that's a different uh, issue, right? I, you know, me being at D doesn't mean I, I only get to be at D once. The thing to think about is only in the pathway, right? I wouldn't want to go back to D. If I were to continue exploring here, right, what are the possible options from D? Oh, well, one route is B, one is E, one is C. Well, from D, I'd care about B and E, not C, because that's where I came from already, right? That's not the same kind of approach here. Um, but uh, just for the sake of time, I'll very briefly look at them. Um, hmm, where, let me hide that. Uh, I don't trust, I'm going to pause that for a second. Okay, so if we're looking at it, someone went with null, that's fine, starting with what is the limit or traversal. Uh, so I will say, you know, this is my kind of, don't worry too much on that part of me asking the limit order. That was mostly like my way, because I have to get you to try and explain this in text form, right? So a little bit going on there if we're looking at... Uh, B, C, so uh, again, you would be doing it in limit order, so you, you still have to say the A part. Uh, so A, B, C, yep. Uh, A, B, so A, B, C, D, D, E. Close. No, uh, I'm going to tell Dr. King that y'all aren't learning your limit orders. There we go, look at that, there we go. Uh, that makes me a little, I heard that. Uh, but no, okay, so far, you know, be mindful of that because I'm looking at this and, you know, I know limit order is not going to be on your midterm, but, uh, yeah, y'all need to refresh your, your, your brain on what limit order was. 
That's it. I, got, I don't have enough time to go into it. So to at least kind of finalize this, you know, not to end, not immediately sending you on your way, but the last search I want to talk about is now sort of a different approach, right? Iterative deepening, you're kind of gradually increasing your search area. Well, I want to kind of present a different approach. What if I also had sort of a starting location and I knew my goal location in a completely observed environment, right? I do see these two things. Maybe I have the ability to backtrack from my goal, right? You've done this in real world, right? This is a real world kind of thing that you would personally do. All right, this is my end game. How, you know, from here, how would I have gotten here? And we'll actually see that in, uh, uh, in planning a little bit later as well. But, okay, well, the same approach. All right, if that's how I, you know, that's my end game, and here are all the possible things that would get me there, right? Again, if we're thinking chess moves, connect four, you know, game moves or something. Same kind of concepts going on. I have my start. Well, what are all the possible moves that I can do from here, and I'm just picking arbitrarily like, you know, four going on here. But what you end up doing is you do two searches at the same time. You have two searches activated, and coincidentally, it is a breadth first search. So it's the queue based structure. You have two queues running in parallel as you go through this. And what do you know? Look at what happens when it comes to space-time complexity, right? Brett first search was, you know, again, it would get us our shortest path, and it would actually do it pretty quickly. It just has a lot to search through, right? Well, what if we just do two Brett first searches from different points of view, in essence? I want to go from A to H. Now, we all can look at this and go, okay, fine. I, I have a very clear uh, number of steps that I can get from there, but again, that same concept goes on. It's two separate queues. I've got Q1, Q2 happening, right? One's going to work forward. One's going to work backwards. A goes in and it accepts, okay, here are my different options. I can go to I, I can go to B, I can go to C. I put them in alphabetical order here, again, because that makes it easier for all of our brains to digest things, right? So in that situation, okay, B, C, I, all right. Then what happens? I go over to Q2. I don't immediately start fiddling with Q1. I go over to Q2, right? I've removed H from the Q. What would be my children? What would be my next possible considerations? And so I make the assessment again. Okay, well, what happens next? And you got five minutes, so say it. I go from Q1 to B. Boom. And notice, oh, that's the assessment. I see that B has another option. It was K. I finish that. I jump back to Q2. Q2 goes to H. I expand it one more time. And so now I got my E and my J. I'll backtrack to C. I will speed through these a little bit more just for the sake of time. So I knock out my C. I go back to Q. I knock out my G. Notice, hey, just because it's in both of my Qs doesn't necessarily mean that I need to automate. I've found the path. Don't, don't make those assumptions, right? It's, these are things that are in consideration, not in the actual path quite yet. Q2 is going to see it, right? But it's still just up for, into, uh, in, uh, for consideration here, right? Because there might be something that's faster elsewhere. I don't know, right? K technically could be you know, faster. We don't know. Anyways, so I just remove G from Q2. I go back to Q1. I remove I. I remove I. I put D in there. I go back to Q2. I remove E. D's also now, we've got that same kind of split action. I got it in you know, three different places. I go back to Q1. I remove K. I go back 
to Q2. I remove J. I go back to Q1. And wouldn't you know it, ladies and gentlemen, because G on the Q2 side is in the path, I've already observed that, I go back to Q1. Look what's about to happen. I'm going to remove it from consideration. I'm going to put it into actually traversed. And I have found a connection. I have found a node that takes my starting side and takes my goal side. I need a different color. And it's bridged the gap between them. And so suddenly, I now have a path from my goal condition or my starting location from some series of movements connected to some series of movements with the goal condition as well. You got two minutes, questions? Yes. It's, so it, it speeds it up. So rather than doing one search and this being X number of moves, by doing two, I might be able to do X and, or half of X. Oh, I see. Yeah. All righty, since you're already trying to get out of here, I bid you adieu, and I'll see you on Wednesday.